Good afternoon everyone. I had every intention to be at this biennial conference. I haven't missed one since 2011, but nature decided otherwise. However, technology has come to the rescue. Who knows, the result may prove to be more advantageous than the real thing. Australian native plants are known to have many values of advantage to humans. I've dealt through history to identify how native plants have been appreciated in the past and if they may have informed the garden design of the present and then best guessed what might be expected of them in the future. So come along with me, it's an intriguing story. For 60,000 years or more, the people of the First Nations managed Terra Australis, the great southern land, as a vast, diverse and bountiful garden. It was, and is, their supermarket, their hardware store and their pharmacy. They traversed the land cyclically and sustainably and harvested foods throughout the distinctive seasons and the varied regional areas. This knowledge was inherited and passed down through the generations as a matter of survival. The Aboriginal people did not design gardens, they did not need to. They expertly used a complex system of land management using fire, together with the life cycles of native plants to ensure plentiful wildlife and plant foods throughout the year. The first settlers and explorers observed that the land looked like a park with extensive grassy patches, pathways, open woodlands and abundant wildlife. Consequently, it is important for us to acknowledge today the people of the First Nations for their exceptional example in the sustainable management of their country. But far more than that, we are indebted to them for continuing to share this legacy with the multicultural people who today call Australia home. Exploration and discovery of 1600 to 1800. Although there are claims of early landings in New Holland by other cultures, Portuguese, Spanish, Chinese, Arabs and even Romans, there is little creditable evidence. The 17th and 18th centuries saw European exploration and botanic discovery firmly establish the existence of Terra Australis. The names of the Dutch and the French and the British mariners are all firmly enshrined in our early history with many commemorated in the botanic names of the unknown plants that they had discovered. The extensive assortment of species they collected in Australia and across the globe were a source of great scientific value. Joseph Banks was the key link in the British and European network of social connections that included royalty, aristocracy, scientists, botanists and garden designers. To a great extent, this defined the future path of world botany, horticulture and landscape. Surprisingly, by the late 1700s, the Empress Josephine of France had established over 200 species of Australian flora in the gardens of Chateau de Malmaison near Paris. Catherine the Great of Russia also established a similar collection in the gardens of Peterhof Palace in St. Petersburg. These unknown exotic species were of great interest to the aristocracy, who strived to outdo one another with grand and unique landscape gardens out, uh, surrounding their palatial country residences. The colonial period, 1788 to 1900. The first European gardens were established here in 1788, immediately after the first fleet arrived in Sydney Cove. Captain Arthur Phillips' Governor's Garden and later a farm at Farm Cove were the first. These gardens were basically a food source with corn, wheat and fruit trees which did not fare well given the poor soil, the heat and the insects. Consequently, a much larger farm was soon established in the rich alluvial soils beside the Hawkesbury River. After 1792, the Governor's Garden became more formal with a direct path to the waterfront with garden beds, hedges and exotic shade trees. By the 1840s, the garden became an informal park. At the time, there was little appreciation of the surrounding native flora because it contrasted so strongly with the soft English landscapes that they had left behind. 
John MacArthur arrived in the Second Fleet in 1793 and established Elizabeth Farm near Parramatta where it still stands today. The homestead displayed the definitive Australian character of a steep pitched roof and wide surrounding veranda. The design of the early gardens was based on simple geometry, direct walkways, flower beds, shrubs and hedges, with the occasional incorporation of indigenous plants. A simple style which still influences the typical rural homestead environments of today. In the early 1800s, the aspirations of wealthy pastoral landholders and merchants were expressed in the building of Greek revival mansions such as Camden Park. An excellent example of these manor houses with extensive formal gardens built throughout the colony. As the 19th century drew to a close, a simple but impressive pastoral garden style with just a touch of native flora became more common. With Queen Victoria on the throne for 63 years, Australia was strongly influenced by Mother England, and together with the wealth derived from the gold rush, many significant parks, gardens and homes were built. The Melbourne Botanic Gardens were commenced in 1846, with Ferdinand von Mueller appointed as the first curator. An accomplished botanist, he collected throughout the continent and in the following 16 years he planned and established a strong scientific basis for the collection, which included many native species. Unfortunately, this collection was impacted by the next curator, William Guilfoyle, whose design followed the fashionable English romantic or gardenesque landscape trend. This style featured a grand park-like setting with significant water features, large shade trees within expansive lawns, mass shrubs in island gardens and flower beds. The style is best represented in the Melbourne Botanic Gardens, but also on most other capital city botanic gardens and other major parks of the time. Around the turn of the 19th century, the vogue for the wealthy to escape the midsummer city heat in a mountain retreat led to the establishment of large houses with pretentious gardens. In the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, Mount Macedon in Victoria, the Adelaide Hills, and Toowoomba in Queensland. In all these places, the soil was richer and the climate cooler, so exotics from many different parts of the world flourished. Reports on the day say these plants were far more spectacular than any native flora could ever furnish. <laughs> Obviously, native plants in those days did not receive much recognition. The early 20th century, Australian landscape style evolves. Federation in 1901 of the six separate colonies into one nation, Australia, inspired a surge of nationalism. This demanded that a new national capital be established and landscape architect Walter Burley Griffin was appointed to plan the development of Canberra, which became a major influence for the new nation. Burley Griffin was a member of the global garden city movement and although an American, he was sympathetic to the local environment and used only Australian native plants. Together, throughout the continent as a people, we slowly became comfortable with and celebrated our growing attachment to this land and its unique environment. This was expressed so eloquently and yet so simply by the words of a single poem, My Country, written by Dorothea McKellar in 1904. At the same time, Banjo Patterson effectively composed our national song, Waltzing Matilda, and Henry Lawson in his poems captured the larrikin essence of Australia. But perhaps the most endearing and enduring influence for most of us through childhood were the antics of Blinky Bill, Snuggle Pot and Cuddle Pie, The Bad Banksy Man and Ginger Megs, each entertaining but educating us too about the very special country that we call home. Do you remember how for 27 years no one ever missed listening to Blue Hills on ABC Radio every day at 1pm. In my view, it was our exposure to this seemingly ever-present celebration of all things uniquely Australian that led to many of we, dare I say it, more elderly citizens to be so passionate today about the use of native flora in our landscapes and gardens. 
The significant national house and garden style inspired by Federation was a mix of architectural geometry and botanic informality, distinguished by sweeping lawns, vine-clad pergolas and gazebos. Formal flower beds were largely replaced by mixed shrub planting and native plants were increasingly added, but always intermixed with exotic trees and shrubs. Tropical region climates dictated a modified Federation style. The distinctive Queenslander emerged. Houses on stilts with wide surrounding verandas, good ventilation, a tracery of lattice and adjustable slat louvers. The architecture was complemented with luxuriant shade trees and rampant foliage, a natural shaded garden character closely informed by tropical rainforest species, unfortunately not always entirely Australian. However, there was another way we learned to subconsciously appreciate a unique landscape and to treasure it. A very talented group of distinguished landscape artists celebrated our unique environment through their paintings and prints of which were hung in almost every schoolroom in the new nation. In addition, our eyes were opened to the beauty and diversity of the unique native flora by a group of skillful botanic artists. They were often referred to as the plant hunters because these female artists tramped the bush to find, record and paint our Aussie plants in location and often in harsh conditions. Early designers across Australia. Specialist Australian garden design began in the early 1900s with several practitioners in Victoria. Together they established the Eltham style, which provided influential inspiration far beyond Victoria, effectively informing for the first time how to plan, design and manage a garden of native plants. Ellis Stones developed a landscape style so subtle and simple that his gardens often looked as though they had just happened. He was inspired by a love of a bush. Nature is the greatest teacher, he said. He strongly believed that gardens are for people with places to sit, relax and escape the summer heat. He deplored the climatically unsuitable English influence in most domestic gardens and public parks at the time. Ellis was a foundation member of the Australian Institute of Landscape Architects and was appointed as a fellow in recognition of his reputation as the father of Australian landscape style. His extensive work included gardens for many project houses in Melbourne and sections of the Royal Botanic Gardens. Edna Walling is perhaps the nation's most influential early designer. She graduated in 1917 from Burnley College with a certificate in horticulture, although garden construction interested her most. Her designs were initially influenced by personal experience as a child roaming the Devon countryside and also by the English arts and crafts movement where gardens were inspired by nature. In 1935, Edna asked Ella Stones to build a stone wall for a project, and she was very impressed. Thereafter, she gave him a free hand in her gardens to create strong frameworks of low stone walls, boulder banks, ponds, and sweeping flagstone paths. By the mid-1940s, as Edna's career flourished, she became enamoured with the Australian bush. Her garden design then became more naturalistic, incorporating timber and rocks, softened with a mantle of greenery, always including indigenous plants. Gordon Ford designed large naturalistic gardens which were informed by the site ecology and the geology of the local landscape. They were rugged gardens offering a stroll through the bush to experience his love of naturalism. Obviously influenced by Alice Stones, his gardens were dominated by rocky outcrops cooled by the restful use of water and softened by the texture and structure of indigenous vegetation, all carefully massed along rambling gravel pathways, often without obvious borders.
Sydney sisters Jean Walker and Betty Maloney instigated a completely new approach to using native plants in domestic gardens through a design philosophy founded on naturalness with order. Their gardens were inspired by the composition of the surrounding bushland. They moved from Colac in Victoria to the native plant rich Hawkesbury sandstone areas of northern Sydney, where they immediately joined the local group of the Society for Growing Australian Plants. Here they established their individual bush gardens using indigenous plants and local organic materials for construction. Strong proponents of the bush garden, so popular in the 60s and 70s, their many books became like horticultural bibles for the native plant enthusiasts of the day. During the mid 20th century, an eclectic group of Queensland practitioners, variously trained in Europe and in Australia, influenced urban landscape and residential garden design throughout the north of the continent from the coast to the inland. The numerous international resort gardens of distinctive tropical pan-Pacific flora were of local influence. However, the strongly characteristic Australian regional landscape and species remained dominant. It was in a flamboyant but relatively short period, as within a decade or so, most resorts were ravaged by cyclones and economic pressures. This influential view, group of landscape architects and designers relied heavily for practical advice about suitability and performance of local and regional native species offered by the unequalled native plant knowledge of two nurserymen and two naturalist graziers, whose properties subsequently became native botanic gardens. All were members of SJP. Without doubt, the most significant event with nationwide influence for promoting the recognition of native plants for gardens was the founding of the Society for Growing Australian Plants by Arthur Swaby in 1957. His words at the time indicate he was a visionary. The largest groups for some time will be in the cities, but the facility for experimental work and the actual economic and aesthetic need for Australian plants will be in the country. The dry inland areas have the greatest need. Our society strongly continues this mission to widely inform the communities of today. The latter half of the 20th century was fundamentally important in advancing the recognition and use of native plants in broad scale landscape planning and garden design. Four landscape architects were front and centre across Australia, each over an extended period and each with a deep knowledge of the land, and each in their own way has been responsible for a range of significant and influential urban landscape projects and parklands which continue to inform the Australian community of the importance of native plants. In Western Australia, Marion Blackwell, AM, a noted environmental scientist and landscape architect, has a profound respect for the knowledge of Indigenous Australians and for the unique beauty and worth of our native species, particularly for use in remote inland developments. Her landscape commissions cover a broad variety of significant projects from World Heritage National Parks to outback townscapes, city public spaces and private gardens. Marion explains why native plants have been so important in her landscape designs. It is because they belong to and just make that particular habitat. In my mind, the most likely plants to survive are those that are already adapted to the conditions of the site. They are unique and appropriate for that location. Victoria. Paul Thompson's basic interest and expertise in landscape architecture is in sharing and expanding appreciation of local native flora in design through a mix of conservation, rehabilitation and innovation. This is best illustrated by his book, Australian Planting Design, which simply describes the application of planting principles interweaved with the related functions and physical components that define planting design. He says, the same universal principles apply for organising and designing gardens anywhere in the world. The difference with what I do is that I only use Australian flora. 
Paul is singularly responsible for a specialised advisory contribution to numerous significant landscape projects, each of which strongly exhibit his design philosophy. Most notably, the contemporary stylized landscape of Royal Botanic Gardens Cranbourne, planned in conjunction with TCL Landscape Architects, effectively complements the scientific and research function of a botanic garden through specialized design relationships of species with their bioregional environments. New South Wales. Bruce McKenzie, OAM, pioneered the Sydney Bush School of Landscape Design, derisively called the nuts and berries style by those more comfortable with tradition. Coming from a graphic design base and a love of bushwalking, throughout 50 years of practice, Bruce has unerringly responded to the local qualities of every site, and he calls it spirit of place. He says, what is essential is to work with the site pay great respect to the people who will use it and respond to the local environment. Bruce was fond of taking risks in using and interpreting the native landscape. It is interesting to look back and see how successful Bruce's approach has been in applying nature-based design in his major projects. And they just get better with age. Now, the fourth practitioner, and uh, it happens to be me. As a committed member of SJP, or Native Plants Queensland, since 1967, my passion for native plants has informed every landscape project for which I have been responsible. My initial and continuing vision over the past five decades was to bring an awareness to the general community of the unique value and quality of the Australian landscape and its flora through applying my ethos, design with nature. For me, the best way to do this was to encourage the establishment of botanic gardens in least, at least one in each of the 13 bioregions of Queensland. That milestone has been achieved always because of the involvement of regional members of SJP supporting me in promoting, planning, designing or rejuvenating more than 20 regional botanic gardens. Just first with these botanic garden projects, it has been a significant responsibility to organise award-winning exhibits of our flora internationally. Through the design of Australian gardens in the UK at the Liverpool International Garden Exposition in 1984, and in Japan at the Horticultural Expo 90 in Osaka. And most significantly, the dominantly Australian landscape of World Expo 88 in Brisbane. More recently, Roma Street Parkland, a significant 16 hectare inner city garden in central Brisbane, was designed to highlight and compare the subtropical flora of Queensland and the world. As we progress through the 21st century, landscape and garden design is obviously evolving and responding to changes in society and in climate, particularly through townscape initiatives that bring nature back into the city. Across the country, a number of garden designers are leading the way, each applying their own unique contemporary design character with native plants in residential or urban landscape projects. Three designers in Victoria are indicative of many others throughout the nation. Fiona Brockhoff. Since graduating from Burnley Horticultural College, Fiona has developed a personal design understanding committed to planning attractive and practical gardens. Whether coastal, country or urban, the landscapes are distinctly Australian and characterised by their simplicity, relationship with the architecture and defined by the strong planting design. The gardens incorporate local construction materials and always use appropriate native plants best suited to the situation. Philip Johnson. Philip's innovative Trail Finders Australian Garden at the 2013 Chelsea Flower Show deservedly received the Best in Show Award. This unique project underlines his personal goal to create functional and sustainable landscapes and gardens that celebrate Australia's enviable natural beauty. He is committed to greening our cities through innovative, flexible and sustainable landscape design that accommodates changing environmental extremes. As he says, 
I want to see an Australian garden style develop. It's crazy that our native plants are more popular in Europe than they are in our own country. I'd love to see us develop a garden culture like that in Japan, where people really value gardens, invest money in them and love them. Sam Cox. Sam builds native gardens in the Australian natural style, first pioneered in the early Melbourne designers of the 1900s. His built landscapes provide enduring, understated beauty in a naturalistic bush garden setting where rock placement, earth shaping and the use of layered and group plantings create seamless transitions with the wider environment. Sam's hands-on approach integrates both design and construction to establish a sense of place and resilience of landscape in response to changing environmental conditions. Books, publications and media. Publications in the media successfully bridge the gap between nature and the garden and play a critical role in encouraging Australians to decide whether or not to embrace gardening with native plants. However, in most of these various sources of information, international garden styles and exotic plants are more commonly discussed and illustrated. Fortunately, our early garden designers such as Edna Walling, Ella Stones, Gordon Ford and Paul Thompson and Bruce McKenzie all wrote books to define and inform their individual approach to garden design with an Australian style. Our society members have also authored many definitive books which focus more particularly on species identification and suitability for growing native plants, which directly inform the garden design process. It is probable that Australians learn more about our native species and how to establish them in correctly maintained gardens from the ABC weekly television program Gardening Australia than from any other source. Although the program content is multicultural, covering both native and exotic plants, this logically reflects the composite international nature of the nation's gardening population. The Garden Design Study Group there's an obvious lack of books dealing expressly with native plants and garden design, perhaps the preeminent information source on this subject was produced by the Garden Design Study Group, now with over 200 members, formed by ANPSA member Diana Snape in 1993. The resultant wealth of design expertise was collected together by Diana and four others and published in the book, The Australian Garden, Designing with Australian Plants. But that was 20 years ago. Gardens have changed and in the future will continue to change further, perhaps more radically and in ways we may not even imagine. Our study group provides an interactive forum for exchange of ideas and knowledge on garden design through the quarterly newsletter, by personal contact and garden visits. We are constantly considering how best to define planning and design solutions that will inform establishing native landscapes and gardens across Australia. All I can say is watch this space. The following series of photographs strongly illustrate how over past decades, our society members across the country have been quietly leading the way in designing and establish their own native gardens. In many ways, they have been influenced by the varied historic precedents of the past 200 years that have informed garden design with native plants. Collectively, these photographs demonstrate the designers' accomplished skills and particularly the individual landscape characters naturally generated by the differing physical conditions from one Australian region to another. These photos also illustrate multiple examples of a developing Australian style, native garden, each of which stand out proudly in competition with any other imported landscape trends. But unfortunately, these gardens really come to the attention of the wider community. Now, these historic precedents in garden design, pre-settlement, this presentation began with the premise that before European settlement, the original natural landscapes of the continent was one beautiful, unique and diverse native garden, fundamentally important to the continuing survival of our First Nations people. 
The traditional knowledge, understanding and stewardship of this unique natural environment, specifically the flora, derived over thousands of years by the people of the First Nations, should be revered and never be forgotten. It is imperative that this related Indigenous knowledge continues to be preserved, valued and applied to inform the planning and design for the use of native plants in contemporary and in future landscapes and in gardens. In the 1700s, from the commencement of settlement in 1788, the local landscape and flora was not widely respected or appreciated. Establishing the new colony in this strange land where everything seemed to be upside down took precedence. Native plants were not seen to be of value or of much use for gardens, and instead they were treated as something to be dismissed, dominated or replaced. In the 1800s, during this century, the influence of Victorian England was strong, but apart from food production, gardening was not a main concern for the people of the developing colonial settlements. Regardless of the many explorer botanists who at the time progressively discovered and documented the unique, previously unknown flora across the continent, the early colonists did not value the local environment and the native flora was not widely understood. What about the present period of garden design in the 1900s? From the early 20th century, Federation inspired designers in all states to consider the country's unique environment and incorporate the flora to inform the design of gardens that truly belonged here. The early designers all had a heightened sense of being Australian. They lived in the Australian landscape and each exhibited a passion for designing gardens with a sense of local place, rather than copying some unrelated imported landscape. It is this national legacy that particularly inspired the typical informal Australian style or walk about or stroll gardens that we know so well today. Diversity of landscape. The sheer size and diversity of our continent with its wealth of unique natural landscapes from the top end to Tasmania and from Perth to subtropical Queensland obviously makes the concept of one Australian style for gardens a nonsense. This initial aspiration has largely evolved into a simple, more realistic and ecologically sustainable goal of creating gardens and landscapes with a sense of local place. The result is that today throughout the continent we have a great diversity of garden characters which reflect a specific design brief but are more forcefully informed by the particular site location, the local environment and the local climate each component inspiring design with nature. Environment values. Today, more than ever, Australians need to be introduced to and informed about sustainability, particularly highlighting the significant environmental benefits of gardening with native plants, and not just the aesthetic qualities of the plants alone. One definition for the design of a sustainable garden suggests that it thrives with minimal water and maintenance, it exhibits steady growth with potential for regeneration, and it uses indigenous flora that supports both itself and, importantly, the reliant creatures, large and small. Consequently, landscapes projects of all scale that sustainably preserve the environments we value and aim to prevent the loss of endangered species are undoubtedly one of the most important investments in our future. And this is equally, if not more relevant for our personal gardens. Climate change. From what we've been told, the climatic patterns are changing matrix. Some regions drier, others wetter. But is that really any different to now? As gardeners, we carefully select and use native species that are appropriate to the local region. 
instead of wasting time and energy in encouraging inappropriate specimens to grow where they really don't want to be. Since we are all native plant nuts, and irrespective of any imposed future changes, I feel sure that we will still continue to establish our gardens as we always have. Because the changes are subtle and happen over long periods, we will have time to modify our approach. Certainly these impacts are, are already being experienced, but just as the Australian flora has adapted over millennia, tomorrow's gardeners will also learn to progressively adapt their gardens to respond to any new global or local changes or processes that are imposed. What about garden design in the future? Whatever happens in years to come, the basic principles of garden planning and design will remain largely unchanged. Microclimate, visual attributes, character and style, plant form, colour and texture, even pruning to form will still be applicable in any new or modified situations. Consider also that most of the future population will live in smaller homes and in multi-storey apartments. Their gardens will need smaller specimens and suitable container plants. In consequence, nursery supply and garden design will need appropriate modification. For reasons of sustainability, many new multi-storey buildings in urban city centres are now often clad in curtains of green foliage with verdant roof gardens. Difficult physical situations like these are not uncommon in the natural landscape. Consequently, nature will be a continuing reference to inform design and plant selection for these vertical and horizontal gardens. Consider also the growing influence of technology, such as breeding new cultivars, hybrids, grafting, etc. Producing new designer plants that will grow where they were never meant to be. As a result in the future, could our landscapes and gardens look the same everywhere across the continent? Will there still be a sense of local place to distinguish one region from another? And is this a valid concern? As a landscape architect, it is, my, it is my considered opinion that these expected future imposed changes will require that tertiary training institutions in landscape and horticulture immediately increase emphasis on the environmental significance and relevance in the use of native plants in landscape planning and in garden design. At least, on an equal basis to that currently offered by exotic flora, but hopefully far greater. In imagining the future, I don't really see too much change from the way we garden now, provided we continue to understand and apply the principles of design with nature. But for me, one thing is absolutely certain. Against my better judgment, I will continue to try growing Eremophila species in my garden in entirely the wrong climatic zone and no doubt in future this will still be without success. The future influence of our society. Since the founding of our society 65 years ago, our members have in so many ways made it their business to constantly inform the community about the importance of preservation, conservation, and of using native plants in the landscape and in garden design. No other group could or ever has contributed so freely to the wider community with so much specialised environmental, botanical, horticultural and personal knowledge, locally, nationally and even internationally. As a society represented in every state and particularly through the study groups, we must continue to do everything possible to inform, assist and ground Australians in understanding the significance and the use of their own landscape. This is an extremely important task. Value that work. The awakening and encouraging of public appreciation about our native species is so vitally important and 
will become even more important in the future as climate change impacts, and more particularly as our population expands while also becoming increasingly multicultural. In conclusion, this presentation has not dealt with broad-scale landscape issues because our ANPSA members have a specific interest in our own patch. We are doers and our personal gardens matter very much to us. I believe that we deserve a hearty pat on the back to acknowledge and encourage our interest and particularly to ensure our continuing commitment to inform the general community about the value of native plants as a vital and integral component in the design of the sustainable landscapes and gardens of our future. Thank you. It's been a privilege to research and prepare this presentation and to deliver, to deliver it to you today. If you enjoyed this presentation, then please subscribe to our channel. Other presentations from the conference are available in this playlist, with new ones being added all the time.